Hello and welcome to my BSD CAN 2022 virtual tutorial Vim for Beginners. I am Benedikt Kreuschling. Many of you know me as one of the voices, one of the moderators from BSD Now, but not in this instance. This is a tutorial and I'm teaching it alone here. I'm also not providing any video output, so you only hear my voice because I thought the video wouldn't provide any extra information or any extra value to you. So we will only see my screen that I'm using to show you the tutorial parts of the editing and my voice in the background explaining these. So why this tutorial? Many people don't know the features of VI and Vim and or don't use it to their advantage. So it's just a simple editor for them. They just edit the stuff that they want to do and get out of it and move on. But I have found that VI and Vim have a lot more functionality under the hood if you know how to use it. And uh, at the beginning, I was also in the camp of just edit and out of there. But as more I learned about Vim, I understood more about its internal workings and the philosophy behind it. And that's why it made me more productive overall. And I'm using the editor much more. So I'm hoping this is also happening for you. Uh, Vim has a lot to offer and maybe a bit difficult for beginners. You hear these uh, internet jokes and memes about how to exit uh, VI and Vim. So that's why we're covering these at the beginning. And hopefully all these things are explained in a pace for you that you can understand them well enough. And uh, many of these things are based on the hard learnings that I had to do. And hopefully my way of teaching these is a bit smoother and you have a better experience learning these VI and Vim is available everywhere on all the Unix systems out there. So when you learn it, you can make use of it pretty much on any Unix system as well as Mac and even Windows. So you learn one editor and use it everywhere. Easy enough without having to relearn yet another editor each time. The focus here is on beginners to get them started with Vim. If you previously had any bad experience with Vim or were frustrated by using it, then this is the tutorial for you because again, it contains a lot of things that I learned the hard way and I've provided hopefully enough information for you to have an easier way to get into it. We will not cover advanced features or any plugins uh, or Vim's internal programming language, only the built-in functionality, but even that is already quite powerful and can make you a productive user. And at many instances you will say, wow, this is built in, this is cool. Why didn't I use it before? Well, because you didn't know about it until you <laughs> attended this tutorial. However, uh, this is a scratching only the surface of what, what Vim can do. After the tutorial is over, you should have enough information to get started learning more about Vim on your own. And even I am still learning new stuff, right? So I encourage you to use Vim's frequent, Vim frequently to commit to muscle memory what you've learned here. And the more you use it, the easier it becomes. The videos here are taken from my undergraduate Unix for Developers course that I teach in the winter term at the University of Applied Sciences Darmstadt in Germany. And there you will find references to UFD, which stands for Unix for Developers, and uh, a letter to Santa in one of them, which always makes the student laugh a little bit, but I thought it would be fitting to the time of year. However, you can use the actual, uh, or ignore the text that I'm typing there. This is just for explanation uh, purposes. And so uh, you can, of course, write your own text. The content is divided into smaller sections with credit-like uh, outros that you may see have seen from the movies after each one of them uh, is repeating the learnings from the previous sections. And I will provide my current lecture script along with this tutorial to BSD CAN. Uh, as it contains even more information that I could provide in this uh, video format. So you can read them afterwards or next to it on your own pace and hopefully get even more information from that. Finally, I want to give a big thanks to the organizers of BSD CAN for putting this online conference together and all the helping hands that made it uh, happen. And thanks to you as well for your interest in this tutorial. Feel free to reach out to me with any comments or questions you might have about it to my email address shown here. And now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this tutorial and learn.
In this video, we take a look at the Vim text editor. We will do some basic editing and show you the features that Vim provides, as well as the modes, which is different from a normal text editor. So to check if Vim is installed on your Unix machine, you can type which Vim. And if that gives you a path, might be a different one than this system. But if there's no path from the which command given, then Vim is not installed. And you would have to use either your package manager's software to search for Vim and install it or compile it from sources. I would recommend you use the package manager that your distribution provides because that typically gives you an easy and convenient way to install Vim. Uh, whatever you use, um, you should have Vim available and you can start Vim by running Vim, which will present you with the welcome screen. And you can already see that there's a blinking cursor in the upper left corner and there's a little bit of information in the middle part. And on the lower right corner, you can see that there's an indicator how many lines there are and what the current text position is. The all in the lower right corner will display how much of the total text file that you're editing or have loaded in the editor is displayed. In this case, there's just this one line because we haven't typed anything yet, so everything is displayed, so all. If there's a bigger file and it cannot fit all on the screen, then there will be a percentage saying how much of the file is left, maybe 50% or 20%. So the first thing that you would notice is when you start typing, nothing is happening. So no characters appear on the screen. So why is that? The reason for that is Vim is a modal editor. So it has uh, various modes that it controls and you can switch between modes using your keyboard. And that makes Vim a very powerful editor in that you have these different modes and you can switch between them. And the whole editor can be completely controlled using the keyboard. So you don't have to uh, move your mouse around or move your hand from the keyboard to the mouse all the time. And that makes you a much more uh, powerful typist. So, uh, but to distinguish any commands that I might have to give the editor, uh, they need to be distinguished from the normal text that I type. So in order to distinguish those, modes have been introduced in Vim. And modes define that keys have multiple purposes based on which mode you're on. So if I'm in the text editing mode, I will uh, enter text as it is. So the B key will provide the B character and so on. And if I'm in a different mode, then the B key might have a different operation. And having multiple modes allows you to move your hands less and perform multiple different actions instead, causing less fatigue when typing. So Vim knows uh, a total of 12 modes. Luckily, we don't need to know all about them. And you would typically use um, roughly four to five on a daily basis. But um, on a quick editing session, there is even less uh, necessary. So maybe one or two. Depends on the task at hand. The mode that we start with is the normal mode, which is the start mode that we're going to be in when we start Vim. And it's also used for navigation and text manipulation. This uh, will be demonstrated in another video. Yeah. So now you want to know how you can insert text in your document. And this is done in the so-called insert mode, very aptly named. And to enter from the normal mode into the insert mode, you would type I. And then you notice in the lower left corner, there is the indicator that you're currently in the insert mode. So now you can type text as you are normally used to. And to get out of the insert mode, you can switch back using the escape key. And that will bring you back into normal mode. And in the lower left corner, there's a confirmation that there is uh, no insert mode anymore. Now, there's another mode called the visual mode. So let's look at that. The visual mode is used for text selections, navigation as well, and moving for selected areas. And to answer the visual mode, you would type V for visual. And now it displays in the lower left corner a different mode. So the visual mode is active at the moment. And now I can select and you can see that the world is now highlighted and I can do 
certain things with it. I can move it around. I can maybe switch it with a different word. So there's a couple of actions that I can do in visual mode, yeah. that, which is different from insert mode, which is also different from the normal mode. Again, to get back from that mode into the normal mode, I would hit the escape key. And again, it's confirmed in the lower left corner that I left the visual mode and I'm in normal mode again. Now, another important mode for Vim is the command mode or so-called last line mode. And the reason for that is it's all happening in the last line of the editor. So to go into the command mode, you can type the colon key and that will move the cursor to the bottom in the last line of the editor. That's why it's called the last line mode. And the blinking cursor asks me to do some action. So what I can do in this mode, in the command mode, is I can run X commands, which is the basic programming language, if you would call it that, um, of Vim. And you can do search patterns, you can also run filters, but these things will be demonstrated in another video. But what's important in the command mode is that you can save and quit the Vim editor. So, so this is a typical example for beginners exactly. who don't know how to exit Vim because the normal key combinations, control C, control D, escape or something else don't actually give you back your shell environment. So how can you exit the Vim editor properly? That is done from the command mode. There are other ways to exit Vim, but in this case, we will look at the command mode a bit closer. So first you have typed some text in here and to get out of this mode, you would probably save this text. So let's try this here. To save this text into a file, I would type W for write. I want to write this text into a file. And if I type enter, it will tell me that I have not provided a file name because now I remember this is a new file. I just started the editor. I have not provided any name of the file. So. I could go back to command mode now and then type W as before, but afterwards I provide a file name for it. Let's call it my text. I don't need the extension, but I use it to make it easy for me to recognize that this was a text. Now, if I type enter, I can see that Vim confirms me that it has written a new file called mytext.txt. It has one line in it, the one that I have here, and this is a total of 12 bytes. So let's make some changes. Uh, for example, I go back into insert mode. I type I. You notice that I'm back in normal mode after I did this action. So this is switching from the command mode after a command has been executed successfully in command mode. I'm auto automatically back to normal mode. Here from normal mode, I insert some more text. I go back to the insert mode using the I key. And now I can say, hello, Wimworld, for example. To get out of this mode again, I type escape. And now I want to save this new text. Now I can run the command mode, colon W. Since I have provided a file name earlier, I can reuse this one. And Wim will confirm that it has now written 16 bytes. Okay, so I can also say, colon W new text to save it into a different file. So I can basically do a save as command. But now again, I just saved the file. How can I quit the editor? So because I have saved all the files that I wanted to save, I can go back to command mode with colon and to get out of the editor or quit the editor, I use colon Q for quit. Let's see. And sure enough, I'm back in my shell environment and I can look at my file system. And here are my two text files that I created using Vim. I can also provide the file that I want to edit as a parameter to Vim. And it will load this file right away without giving me the welcome screen. And I can continue editing this file as I like. So let's make another edit. I go back to insert mode using the I key and change the file and go back out using the escape key. And now if I want to quit out of the editor, Vim warns me that this change has happened and whether I want to save this file or want to discard my changes, 
and Vim will not let me out of the editor before I've made a decision. So let's say I don't want to save these changes. So I can say, uh, I, you can see from the error message that the exclamation mark is provided. So you can say colon Q exclamation mark. That will bring me out of the editor and all the changes that I've made in the meantime are discarded. So they are not saved in the text file. And if I load it again, I have the old version back. The typical way is that you want to actually save those changes. So let's do them again. I go back into insert mode and make some changes again. Maybe like this. And again, exit insert mode, go back to normal mode using escape. And then I type W to write and Q because I want to save and quit at the same time. And Vim does that and brings me back to my shell environment. There are multiple ways to open text files in Vim. So one way is to run Vim without any parameters. So this will bring me back to the welcome screen and I can use the last line mode to open a file. For that, I use colon E to edit and then provide the file name. And if that file exists, Vim will load it and present me with the contents. So I can make changes in here, going back to insert mode, make the changes and go back and save as I have demonstrated before. Another way is to run Vim providing the file that I want to have on the command line as shown before, and it will do the same. Another way to open a file is the read command. So I can run the read command from command mode. I type read and I want to open my text file and this will read the text file and put the contents into my editor. Now the Vim developers thought that typing read most of the time is a bit tedious. So they abbreviated that command using colon R. And again, you provide a file name and that will do basically the same. It's just an abbreviation, but saves you a couple of keystrokes. Another interesting thing that I can do with the read command is that I can put the current contents of the local directory that I'm in into the editing window by using the read command again. So I go into command mode, I type R, then I type exclamation mark, which will branch to my shell. And then I type an LS and this will put everything that is the result from the LS command into my editing window. Vim can also provide you with a file browser. So instead of providing a single file on the command line, I can type Vim local directory. And this will open a netrw window, which is a Vim built in that will provide you with a file system browser. And this way I can move to the file that I want to edit and type enter. And this will load this file. And this way I can if I'm not sure which file I want to edit, I can give me a local listing of the current directory and then select the file that I want and it will load into the editor window. Another interesting feature that Vim provides is editing files that are not on your current system. So I have a file on another machine that I want to edit, but I don't want to, you know, connect there, copy the file locally, edit it there, and then copy the changes back up into the file. I can use Vim's built-in SCP command to connect to another machine. Now I can provide a username and then the host name, another host in this example. And if there's a non-standard port being used for the SCP command, this is secure copy, which is based on SSH. Then I can provide the port here in this case, it's port 22 by default, so I can omit that. And now I type two slashes to distinguish the host portion from the file system path. And I need to provide the full path to the file. So this file resides in slash TMP. So I provide another slash TMP. And the file that I want to edit is called Santa letter. So now Vim will connect to the machine, see if the file is there, 
and you can see that it temporarily created a file in my local temp directory and it asks me to type enter which I'm going to do and here is the file that I have on the remote machine and I can make changes to it for example, this text. And now that I'm satisfied with it, I can save it and quit out of the editor. And now you saw a brief SCP command, which is basically copying the file back from my local machine into the remote machine. And I don't have to do all the extra copying and back. It's all done by Vim using the SCP command. And if I want to see that the changes actually made it to the remote machine, I can use SSH to confirm those. And run a cat command on slash TMP Santa letter TXT. And this way I can confirm that all the changes that I've made are being saved on the remote machine and I don't have to copy the file back and forth all the time. Now, for this thing to work, you need to have SSH keys exchanged between the remote host and your local machine, and otherwise you will be asked for a password or it won't work at all. So, But I demonstrate this in another video where I show how you can set up SSH for passwordless SSH login into a remote machine, setting up keys and exchanging the keys with the remote machine so you don't have to type your password all the time. In our last episode, we looked at some basics of Vim, opening files, editing them, and getting to know some of the modes that Vim provides. In this video, we use this knowledge to create a configuration file, because, and that is one of the reasons why we learn Vim, because most of the Unix files are simple text files. The configuration files are in particular ones that we will take a look at, and you will notice that many of the Vim functions may not be very useful from the beginning, so we can configure our Vim editor with its own configuration file. And doing that, we also learn a little bit about file editing in Vim, a bit more advanced stuff, and getting to know Vim's configuration file while we do that. So let's look at our current file system. If you've run Vim at least once, there is a hidden file in your home directory called .vim.info. And if we look at that, it and in this file, there are some things contained that Vim uses for opening files the next time or giving you some search string history, for example, or other things that make Vim a bit more comfortable to use the next time you run it. So in this particular instance, I have not done much with Vim. So the command line history is shown here. Uh, so I did basically just a quit out of the editor, but this is already stored in the Vim info file next time I would need it, then it's available. But in general, there is uh, a global configuration file called uh, vimrc, but it's encouraged that each user will have their own .vimrc file in their home directory, because then they can make custom configurations for their own vim editing that is separate from other users editing. So let's do a Vim session for a configuration file and see what features we might want. So I'll do Vim CSHRC. And Vim will distinguish the configuration file contents from the actual comments in that file, if there are any. Um, but many people think that the basic layout or the basic look and feel of Vim is very uh, simple and doesn't provide you very much. So. For example, a lot of people are missing line numbers in the editor. By default, no line numbers are displayed and uh, people might want to know which line am I on. Of course, when they move the cursor in the lower right corner, you can see that uh, it is changing if I move up and down. 
but some people prefer to have their editor displayed line numbers uh, on the left side. So we can make Vim do that. And the way to do that is by running a command in command mode and last line mode. So we go back to this one using the colon key as we know by now. And to enable line numbers, we can write set number. And once I've done that, Vim applies this change automatically and it will now display line numbers on the left side. And as I move down, I can see that it scrolls with it, no matter how long this file might be or how short, then it will always display the current line that I'm on. So I like this setting and I want to have this in each file that I'm opening without having to run it each time from the command mode. So I can go back and do this as a permanent setting. And this is going to be in my vimrc file. So I create my vimrc file if it's not existing already. So Vim's configuration file is basically a text file and I can provide comments. Uh, Vim uses a different comment character that you might uh, know from other Unix files. So this is the double quote in Vim, and that starts a comment here. And I can say, this is my vimrc file. And if I hit enter, Vim already continues this comment. So maybe I have a multi-line comment here so I can continue writing, but uh, I don't want to do that here. I go back and delete the extra character. So what each vimrc should have is a line that says, don't be compatible with the VI editor. Remember that vim is an extension of VI. Vim is VI improved, basically. But the VI settings are sometimes not what we want to have. We want to make use of the more comfortable vim settings. So we tell vim not to use any of the VI settings with the directive called set no compatible to indicate that we don't want to be compatible with the VI editor and just use the Vim settings. And I should provide a comment for myself to know what this line is doing by saying activate line numbers. And I say, of course, set number. This is the exact command that I put in the last line mode before. I quit insert mode and save my file and go back to the editor. And now let's see if this change will already be applied. So I run my edit of the C shell RC again. Could be any other file, doesn't matter. And now you can see that Vim reads the Vim RC file when it's, when it's there and applies all the settings that are in there. And you can see on the left side, there is the line numbers that I want to have. If I'm not sure if a certain setting is active or not, I can ask Vim what's the current setting by saying in command mode, set number question mark. And this will display the current setting. So it says number is active so because number is set. And that indicates me that numbers are indeed active. I can also deactivate numbers again by running set no number. And this is the opposite of setting number. So no number is opposite of number. And if I activate that, then the line numbers disappear. To confirm that, I can ask Vim set number question mark. And it will tell me no number is currently active. And, and this is what Vim displays here or not displays more like. You can also toggle a Boolean setting. If you have uh, like number or no number, you can toggle this by running set number exclamation mark. So if it's off, it will be on. And if it's on, then it will be off. So with set number exclamation mark, I can activate a formally deactivated option and vice versa. So if I use it again, then it will be off. That's very useful and it allows me also to demonstrate here the command history. So if you run colon and use your cursor keys, then you can scroll through the already put in commands that you did from earlier sessions. So you can pick the one you already ran and pick the one you like. If 
for example, this one and just enter it without having to type it all the time. So this is very useful if you have a lot of changes in last line mode made and want to just get back to those without typing them. Maybe they are very long or very complicated and you don't want to remember them. Just put them out of the history and uh, save yourself some typing. Now when I quit Vim and go back to the file, it will again read the configuration file each time and apply all those changes. So my numbers are active now, even though I deactivated previously, because the settings in the last line mode only apply to the current session in Vim. If I close Vim, then it's over. And next time I run it again, the settings will be read anew from the VimRC configuration file. Another option that we can set in our VimRC file is the color that Vim should use for displaying the contents of a text file. So we already see this here, but this is the Vim standard, which may or may not be to your liking, but plenty of colors are available in Vim. So to see what is available, we can go back to command mode and type color uh, and then use the tab completion that we know from our shell and it will show us the available options. And let's pick the first one. Okay, this is a bit uh, too blue for my taste. Let's pick another one. And again, each time I type tab, I advance the curse a little bit further. So let's try this one. Yes, this is a little bit better, but maybe we can find another one. And if I go through this, I can see what it's going to look like. So let's see what this gives me. Ah, this is much more pleasing to my eyes at least. So this is a color that I like and I want to have this applied to each file that I'm opening in Vim. So this is going to go in my VimRC file. Then I go back to my VimRC file and add a comment for myself first so I know what I did there. Put some color into it and say color and give the name of the color scheme that you saw at the bottom. Go out of it, save. And now when I open the file again, or any other file, doesn't matter, the color is applied right away to this file. So pick a color that you like and set it in your configuration file. The VimRC is exactly made for this purpose. Configure the editor to your liking and without having to go back to last line mode and set it each time, which might be tedious. Now that we have line numbers available, I can run Vim and jump directly to a specific line by running Vim. Let's go back to line 25 of the Seashell RC. And you can see that my cursor is now at line 25. So if I know where I'm going, I can directly jump to that specific line and make some edits there right away. But let's say I have picked a very bad theme here or I have a very big file that I'm editing and I cannot find my cursor. It's, it's somewhere in this text editor, but I cannot see it right away. But Vim can provide you with a little bit of help to locate your cursor and know which line you're currently at. So this is done by running set cursor line. And you can see now that there is a line and it tells me, ah, I'm really at line 25. And if I move around this helpful line horizontally will display where I am. So it will always follow me around wherever I am in this file. I can scroll at least a little bit and it will always stay with me and tell me where I am. Now I can also do this for the vertical axes. So I can say set cursor column. And now I have a vertical column that will just like in a crosshair move around with me and in each line that I'm going it will follow me around vertically and I can exactly tell where I am in which. So really this is a very precise locating of my cursor position here. So I don't really, my personal taste is not to use cursor column, but um, I got used to set cursor line, so I will put this in my vimrc file. And again, I edit this file, dot vimrc, and say, 
activate my cursor line. And I say set cursor line. And so this is what I'm going to have next time I open any kind of file in Vim. The line will always be staying there with the horizontal indicator with me. So each time I'm moving around in the file, Vim will indicate where I am with the horizontal line. Let's go to line 23 of C shell RC. And here I am 23 line is empty, but the cursor line is there to show me where I am. In this part of our Vim video series, we will take a look at navigating in Vim. Which is navigating in Vim is a very powerful operation because it requires only a couple of keystrokes and you will get there where you want to be. For this exercise, we navigate out of our home directory and we'll move into the file system and use a file called devd. This might not be available on all the Unix systems, but uh, the actual contents are not important here, what they do. It, it's more a demonstration to navigate into a file without covering the contents too much. So these are the file's contents and we are currently at the first line and, and we have our line numbers active as well as our cursor line. So we know always where we are. And the first thing that I want to show you, we are still in normal mode and all these operations will happen in normal mode. The first thing I want to show you is how I can jump to a specific line because that might be very important. For example, you get an error message indicator that something is wrong on line 23, for example, or you want to see what's happening in 42 so you know exactly where you want to go within the file. And it's fairly easy to get there by running colon and then the line number. Let's go to line 50. And this will scroll down to line 50 and will show the current file's contents. So the cursor line underlines line 50 at the moment. And there's a couple of lines before and after as well. If I want to jump back to line 2, I hit colon 2 and it will display line 2 at the top. So that's a very useful way of navigating quickly to a specific line within the file. Some people may ask, well, what happens if I navigate to a negative line? So let's try this here. Let's go to minus 23. And line 23 doesn't exist. So Wim tells me, of course, this is an invalid range that I specified. So, so I cannot get there. The same goes with line 0. The line 0 is indicative to the very first line, to the so top of the file, first, first line, first column. Some people want to know how do I get quickly to the last line. Maybe I want to add something at the end. You could try to use the last line mode and enter a very, very high numbers. Vim will bring you to the very highest number. In this case, this is line 336, but um, there are quicker ways. So let's quickly go back to line one. And the way to do this is another shortcut using shift G, which will always bring you to the end of the file. So you can see in the lower right corner, it says BOT, which stands for bottom. Line. Then two lowercase g's will get me to line one. And this not only works in Vim, but also in pagers like more or less. So you can recognize these and reuse these commands in other Unix pagers as well. You can also say, I want to go to maybe 75% of the file. So you can just type 75% and it will bring you to 75% of the total file. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the file one more time. 
colon zero, or I could also use GG, and that will have the same result. A lot of people want to scroll, and that's certainly possible with Vim with various ways. So I could say, I want to scroll down maybe half a page. So I just want to get down a little bit further down, but still retain some of the current contents that are on the screen. The way to do this is running control D because I want to scroll down. So that's the mnemonic there, scrolling down half a page. And that brings me to line 25. You saw earlier, let's quickly go back. The total number of lines that can be displayed in this resolution or in this window is 48. And if I scroll down half a page using control D, I land at line 25. The same way can be used to scroll up which is control U because U means scroll up a half a page and that will bring me back up. Let's scroll down two pages. So I'm at line 49 now. And if I want to scroll half a page back, I type control U and I'm roughly back at line 25. Okay, so how do I scroll down a full page or forward? Well, this is control F. And this brings me right away to line 47. Another one is 93. So it's always going a full page without retaining any of the previous things that I saw on the screen earlier. Now I can maybe scroll back half a page, which is again, control U. And so this way I have a way of either moving forward or backward full page or a half page, depending on my needs. If I want to scroll back up a full page, which is backwards, I use control B. And control B will scroll up a full page until I'm at the beginning. So to go down to the very bottom of the file, I use control F because that scrolls down much faster than half a page because control F is scrolling a full page down. And so this way I can navigate up and down the way I like it. Now, You'll notice that there are a couple of uh, curly braces here in this file to you know, wrap around a certain section. As a programmer, I often want to go to the matching either closing curly bracket or opening curly bracket. So I can go there. I can go to the opening brace and I can type the percent sign, which will jump to the matching curly bracket in this case, this is on line 28. And if I type percent again, it will go back to the matching opening curly. So I'm back at line 10 now. So this is very nice. It, the percent sign works for brackets, braces, and curly braces. So this is useful because these are very common in many programming languages. So they have not picked a separate key for that. So the percent sign will always jump to either the opening or the matching closing. Let's look at another here. So here on line 24, the closing is a couple of characters further down the line and I can my cursor can jump between those back and forth. Another one here, I can jump right to the end of this one. So in case I have a big function, for example, that spans multiple pages here, I can always use this to jump right away to the closing bracket further down. Or if I'm down there, I want to get up, I use the percent sign and jump back up. Another way to navigate is to jump to the next word. So I can, with, so I can move within a sentence to the next word. And that is done using the W. So W will jump to the next word. And you can see it will always land at the beginning of the word. And if the sentence is complete, then it will go to the end. If I hit another W, I will go to the beginning of the next word and the next sentence. And this way I can move through sentences fairly and quickly. I can also say, go to the end of the current word. So I'm currently at the word because, and if I want to go to the end of the word, I type E, and this will bring me to the last character of the current word. If I hit another E, it will jump to the last word of the sentence and the last character is the current one under the cursor. There is also a way to jump back or backwards from the current word and that is done hitting the B key. So 
one more time. And this way I can jump forward using the W and backwards using B. This is very useful if you want to quickly go to a word without having to, you know, select each individual character here, which might be tedious to get to. A lot more key presses are used this way, but if I just want to use W and B, I get there much quicker. There is also a way to jump to the beginning of the line, and that is done using zero. So if I hit zero, I will immediately be brought back to the beginning of the line. And that might also become in handy when you move from a very long sentence to the very beginning of this line. How can I jump to the end of the line? That is done using the dollar sign. So if I hit the dollar sign, it will be positioned to the last word in this line, the last character in this example. If I want to jump back to the beginning of the line, again, I hit zero. And if I want to go to the end, I hit dollar. And this is a much better way to navigate rather than moving each individual character forward and backward. So if you remember these little mnemonics here, zero for the beginning of the line, dollar for the end of the line, you will be there much quicker with a lot less key presses. So here's a way how many people navigate Vim when they're a little bit more advanced. So many people don't use the cursor keys to navigate up and down, or they use different keys instead. And these keys are H, J, K, L. When you look at your keyboard, if you have a standard US keyboard or many of the European keyboards also have that, the H, J, K, and L keys are right next to each other. Let's look at the J key, and the J key will navigate us down. It looks a little bit like an arrow pointing down with one side missing. So if you hit the J key, you will be brought one line down. Now, the key next to it, K, will do the opposite. It will move the cursor up one line. If you want to go down again, hit J. And if you want to go up, hit K. All of this is done in normal mode. If you want to move left, you hit H. This is a bit unintuitive at the beginning because you might think that L stands for left, but H is to the left of J. And that way, it's the furthermost key to the left. And that is why H is the key to move to the left. Now, there is only one key remaining that we haven't used yet. And that is the L key. And you would have guessed by now, L key moves you to the right. L doesn't stand for left. In this case, it's moving you to the right. So maybe that is a little mnemonic that you can remember. So I encourage you to look at J because that really is looking like a little arrow with one of the sides missing. And that will make you remember, ah, J is moving down, K is moving up, L is moving to the right. And the last key here that we haven't covered is H moving you to the left. And if you position your fingers over them, you can really quickly move up and down, left and right. And I would encourage you to practice this a little bit because it gives you a much better handling of VI and moving around much quicker without moving to the cursor keys all the time. Maybe you're doing some quick actions, uh, switching to insert mode and then moving around again. And so this way you just move your fingers a little bit further up to the I key. And if you want to move again, you move your fingers a little bit further down to get to the navigation without having to make a longer travel from the I key to the lower right corner to the cursor keys. Many people deactivate the cursor keys in Vim when they are a bit more advanced, um, but I'm not demonstrating that here because I think this is personal preference and the cursor keys work just as fine. I just want to demonstrate and show you that H, J, K, and L are closer to the keys that give you a lot of functionality in Vim and there is less hand movements involved. Now that we know about the H, J, K, and L key, and the navigation in Vim, we can combine it with different options to move not just a single line up and down or left and right, but also multiple lines. So a single key press of J will move me down and another one of K will move me up. But what do I do if I want to go four lines down? Well, I type 4J. 
and it moves me four lines down from my current position. Same goes for K. If I want to move three lines up, I hit 3K and I go back up three lines. The same is true for H and L. Let's say I want to move six characters to the right and I hit 6L and here I land at the end of script. If I want to move two characters to the left, I type 2H and I'm two characters to the left. So with this technique, you can position your cursor anywhere you like. And it also works for jumping between words, which we covered earlier. So if you want to move again a word, then I type W. But if I want to move five words ahead, I type 5W. And I land at the fifth word in this line from my current position. If I want to move back, same thing. Let's go four words back and I land at a different position within the same line. So with this combination, the number and then the action, for example, movement or jumping a word ahead or back, you can really precisely tell Vim what it should do and it gives you a lot of control how you navigate within the file. In this video, we will learn how to do a cut, copy and paste operation with Vim. For that, we open our previously edited VimRC file. And here it is from a previous exercise. First of all, we should take a look at line 7. To copy a line in Vim, I use the yank command. The yank command is the equivalent of the copy operation and Yank is just a different name for copying that into a register. And in this register, this content of the line can be put from there back into any position within the text file that I like. So to yank the whole line, I use YY. And then I move to where I want to have this line, maybe over here. What I do is I move to the line above the line where I want to have it. So I want to have it in line nine. So I move my cursor to line eight. And then I use the paste operation to copy that from the register into the line. And to execute the paste command in normal mode is to press the P key. And that will put the contents of the yanked register into this line. I can do this multiple times. So each time I press P, the content will be put into a new line in Vim. Now that is a bit too much comments for my taste, so I want to delete them as well. So that is of course possible in Vim. To delete a line in Vim, I can use the delete command. And if I use it for the whole line, I press DD. D stands for delete. So if I press DD, the line will be deleted and it disappears. Now, as you might have guessed, I can also not just delete a single line, but I can also delete multiple lines. So if I want to delete this line and the next one, so line 10 and 11 in this case, I can press D2 and then move my cursor to indicate in which direction do I want to delete. Do I want to delete the two lines above? No, I don't want to do that. I want to delete this line and the line below. So I press the J key which, as you remember, is moving the cursor down one line. Now, you will notice that it says in the lower left corner that it says three fewer lines. And that is the reason because Vim deletes an extra line. If you indicate two lines, then it will delete actually three lines. And that is important to know. Otherwise, you delete more text than you want to have. Of course, I can also not just copy and yank a single line. I can also copy multiple lines. So let's say I want to copy lines four and five. Then I do a similar operation. I use yank two and then J 
to indicate which lines I want to yank, the ones from the current position, and then the ones after it, five and six in this case. And Vim confirms me that it has three lines yanked in the lower left corner. And now I can move to a position maybe down here and press P again. And the three lines that were in the register are in the text file now. If I want to delete them again, I can press D2 and there they go again. Now let's take a look at the registers that I currently have. So I can look at them from last line mode and typing registers. And you can see that everything that I've worked with at the moment is already stored there. So Vim has a couple of registers available. So registers are basically placeholders where I can put text in and pull it out again if I need to. And Vim has a number of registers, so you can think of these registers as like clipboards. You remember from other text editors that if you put something in the clipboard and you copy something else into it without pasting it before, the previous content is deleted. With Vim, you have plenty of registers available, so you can copy a lot of text into it and pull it out as needed. So here, for example, you have registers from zero to nine, or you can copy some text in. There might be some text in already, but in some of them, like seven, eight, and nine, there isn't. And there are also named registers. You can see this in the second to last line where you have double quote A, A, B, C. This is a register that is named A in this case. And I have registers from lowercase A to Z. So there's plenty of registers available to use. So here, in register A, I have ABC stored. If I want to paste it out of there, I can go back to my text. And now I address this register by typing double quote A, which is the name of the register, and then press P as we learned before. And you can see that the content of the A register ABC was put at the current position. If I want to store something in a specific register, maybe I want to store my color scheme here, then I can press double quote, the name of the register, it's, let's use C and use YY again, because I want to yank the whole line, and that will store it in the register. Let's see what registers tells me about it. Yes, the C register now contains my color scheme. And if I want to put it somewhere else, maybe I put it at the end of this file, to paste, I use a separate mechanism. I press double quote, C and P for paste, and it will put the register's content into this line. Very useful, especially because it works across files. So if I quit out of this, I don't want to save what I did here. So I just quit without saving. And let's go to another file, maybe this one. And if you now call up the registers, you can see that everything that I stored previously is still in the registers. I can use this to copy lines from one text file to another. For example, here I should probably put in the ABC. So I can do double quote A and P to paste. And here's my register content ABC from register A. That's very useful if you have, for example, configuration lines that you just cannot remember. You should store them in a register in Vim and paste it to the configuration files wherever you need it, or whole text sections, whatever you need to preserve across text files. This is available with plenty of registers available in Vim. Remember, A to Z is available to you, as well as the numbered registers 0 to 9. So let's delete this here again. And now if I look at registers, there is also the quoted register, as you see at the very first line, the ABC is content there. And if I pull text from there, I can also do that. Double quote, double quote, paste. And this is what I just deleted. Maybe I delete this line. And if I call up registers, and everything that I delete will be put into the register with the name double quote. So if I want to restore that, I can move to the line above and press double quote, double quote, and P. And here is my previously deleted line again, so I can restore that. So this is very useful. So now we saw that we can copy with yank in this case. 
So you have to remember it's not C, it's Yank. And with Yank, you can copy text into a register. And if you want to address a certain register, you have to use the double quote and then a register number or a register character, and then it will be put there. Then we saw that we can also delete text. This is the easiest one. To delete a single line, I press DD and it will be removed. But it's still available in a certain register, which is the quoted register. So you can always, if you accidentally delete something, get it back remembering this register name. And to paste, that's fairly easy. You either address a register number or the previously deleted text is it still available. And to give you a bit of a shortcut, you can just press P and the previously deleted parts are being restored from that register. Now, let's say I want to delete the next four lines, and that is certainly possible. By remembering what we already learned, I can use D4, and the four lines are being deleted. But Vim says five fewer lines, so you have to remember that's always an extra line that is being addressed. So if I want to restore those lines, we know this by now, I use the quote register and restore from what I have. Maybe you want to delete a bigger section here. Maybe I want to delete this whole if statement here. And I luckily have activated line numbers so I can make the calculation and know how many lines there are. But even if it's a much longer number of lines that I want to delete, maybe they don't fit on this screen here. I maybe want to delete over 100 lines. How do I know how many there are without deleting anything that I don't want to delete? Well, Vim helps you by giving you extra visual help. And that visual help can be activated using set relative number. And that will still preserve my line numbers, but they are a bit different now. So you can see I'm still at line 25, but above and below this one, it says one, two, three, four, five. And this indicates how many lines there are. So if I'm now at line 25, and if I want to delete the whole if statement, then I can say D, 19 because there are 19 lines below this one and if I do that the whole if statement is deleted nothing else and just this portion so these relative line numbers really help me address the number of lines that I want to delete so let's put them back here if I move my cursor you can see that the line number changes from line 25 to 24 because now I'm one line above this one and also the relative line numbers have changed. So let's see down there, I can now address up to 20 lines to get to the end if statement. If I want to delete those, I press D20 and the whole statement is gone, including this empty line that I'm currently at. If I want to restore this again, quote, quote, P and I'm back with my whole if statement. And moving around, you can see that always the current line changes and the relative number, that's, that's why this option is named this way, is displaying how many lines are above and below. This is especially useful if you delete a lot of text or big portions of text and don't really want to delete anything else. And it doesn't also work for deletion, it also works for copying. So if I move to line 11, so with these relative line numbers, I can also address exactly how many lines I want to have. In this case, I want to copy from line 11 all these alias statements, and there are four of them because the relative line number indicates that there are four below. And to copy those, I just press yank four, and it tells me five lines have been yanked because it includes the current line as well. So the current line plus four makes five lines that have been yanked. And my registers confirm that. So these carry characters here indicate that this is a line break and this will indicate also if it's a J that there's a movement towards the next line because J indicates the next line. And this gives you an indication of how many lines there will be. Let's paste them one more time. Maybe I want to duplicate them down here. And to do that, I just go and press the P key and all of those lines, it tells me five more lines in the lower left corner. From my previous end if position, I have five more lines. One, two, three, four, five. So these are the basics of copying and pasting. And I would encourage you to remember those because they're very useful and fairly easy to remember. 
and I encourage you to make use of them. So use yank to copy, p for pasting, and d for deleting text in normal mode. And with a number before that, you can indicate how many there should be yanked, copied, or deleted. In this video, we will look at searching and replacing text within a file. But first I want to address a couple of questions that came up from the last video about yanking, deleting and pasting. People have been a bit confused about why Wim would delete an extra line when I say D2 and then J in the direction of where I want to delete. And I want to address this here. So. Let's go back to the file that we edited before. To delete two lines, we basically start from the current line and then having our indicator set relative number actually tells us what's going to happen. If I want to delete this line and the next one as well, I would use D1 and then J to get down to the next line and that addresses actually these two lines. So that hopefully clears it up and I think it's better to address this here rather than doing a complicated edit of the previous video and re-recording it. So I hope this didn't confuse you too much and you figured out what I meant. People have also asked if there is a different way how they can paste and that is possible. So for example, you saw that when I paste using the A register, it will be inserted in the line below the current one. So I was at line 20 and it got inserted in line 21. But sometimes this is not desired, so people want to have it in exactly that line where the cursor is. And that is possible using the uppercase P. And you can see that it exactly got inserted in the line where I had my cursor. Now to the content of this video, I want to demonstrate how you can do searches and replacements within Vim. And that is also done in normal mode. So searching is a very common operation if you have a text file that is very big or has a bunch of text in there and you just wanna search for a specific word or phrase. And searches start with the forward slash and then you provide the word you want to search. Let's see if I maybe find the word editor in here. And if I type enter, Wim tells me pattern was not found. So apparently in this whole file, in this whole text, there is no match of editor in lowercase. Okay, let's do another search. And as I was typing, it automatically started looking for it, highlighted it. So I'm at line nine now. And certainly this is the search result. And if I type N, it will jump to the next search match if there is any. And using this a couple of times, I can jump from result to result. And if the match would be on a different page, not on the current one, it will jump to that and Vim would scroll accordingly to that. Now, if I type another N, again, I get the search hit bottom message and it will go and wrap around and start from the beginning going to the first match. There are a couple of options for the VimRC that I can use to influence how the search operation works and what it does. So, let, so let's go back to our VimRC file. And here at the end, I can now add a comment for myself that these next options will influence how searches work in Vim. By the way, people have asked how they can add a line option. Below. So you know a way now because what you can do is you could copy this line and paste it right after and just go into insert mode and delete everything. But of course, there is a better way or an easier way in Vim. You can tell Vim that you want to insert a new line. From, and if this is the last line in the file, it will start a new one. And the way to do that is to press the O key and O will insert below the current line and it would immediately move you from normal mode into insert mode. So you can start making changes here. 
So you can say search options and to insert another line below this one, hit O again and you can get into insert mode and start typing right away. Another way to insert a line is above the current cursor position. So if the lowercase o inserts below the current position, then the uppercase o inserts above the current position. And that way you can make any kinds of edits within the file, either above the current position or below it. People have also wondered how they can make inserts from the current position where the cursor is at and I'm in normal mode and to switch to insert mode after the current position I can press A and this will put me in insert mode and I can make additions to where my cursor was and that gives me a way to insert text from the normal mode. If I want to make additions to the end of the line That's if I press the uppercase A I'm being brought to the end of the line, no matter how long it is, and I can make additions there as well. And going back to normal mode. So let's try this again. I go to the very first character of the line by pressing zero. And now if I press shift A, I'm in insert mode to make more changes. This is very useful. So lowercase o, is good for inserting text below the cursor, uppercase O above the current cursor position, use A, A to attach or append text after the current position, and uppercase A to move to the end of the line and add text there. So let's go back to our search options and let's search for the word numbers. And as I start typing, nothing is shown, but when I hit enter, I will be shown the matches in the file. There is an option called set ink search, which means incremental search. So as I'm typing my search term, Vim will automatically start matching any kind of characters that I was already typing. So let's do that. Set ink search. And now let's search for numbers again. And as I start typing, you can see that Vim already shows me the current matches for N. There's a couple of them, but if I type the U, some of those are now not highlighted anymore. And as I keep typing, now that I have only two matches, and if I add the S at the end, it will move to the still matching search term and will deactivate the ones that don't match anymore. And if I hit enter, it will display only the matching ones. So the incremental search gives you much quicker results, but if you hit enter, you will jump to the lines that really match the current entered word. So this is what I like, and I add this to my vimrc file. So I'll add set ink search. I also want to highlight any search results. So this is active at the moment, and I can manipulate this using set no hl search. And you can see that the highlight goes away. So let's search for number again. And you can see that things are not highlighted in red yet, unless I press enter. But now the word is not highlighted. So only the cursor is moved to the word that matches and there's no visual highlighting of it. But I like the highlighting, so I'll activate it again. And I also add it to my vimrc file so that it's active each time I'm searching. You can also tell vim to ignore upper or lowercase matches by typing set ignore case. And now if I search for set, it will still highlight the lowercase sets in this file. And of course, this will match more. So I'm not using this option because I really want to just have my exact matches in this so I deactivate it again, set no ignore case. And I want to make sure this is always the case when I'm searching. So I set ignore case. So these are some of the changes you can make to your vimrc file to manipulate the search and how it's displayed and done. Now that we know how we can make searches, we also want to know 
how we can replace the searched words and this is done in a very similar way to the searches. Maybe I want to replace these alias definitions here to disable them temporarily. So to replace a word alias with unalias mode I would and type colon s for substitute then indicate that I want to search something with the forward slash. I'm searching for alias and then another slash divides the search word with the word to be replaced and, and I want to replace it with unalias. And now I provide uh, another slash to close my replacement word. And when I enter that, I can see that in line 9, alias was definitely replaced with unalias, but the other lines 10 to 13 were not changed. Using this pattern, I can tell Vim to only replace the first matching word and not any others that might follow. If I want to replace everything within the file, I will provide a slightly modified command line which is colon percent s, so substitute again, search for the word alias and replace it with the word unalias and close that command with another forward slash. And this way Vim would go ahead, searches the whole file and in each instance the search word is replaced. To replace a certain portion or selection of the text file with a replacement, I can use the visual mode for that, which we haven't seen much from. In this instance, I would use visual mode. So let's say I only want to replace the first three from lines nine to 11, and I hit V to get into visual mode, and then select the lines that I want to have, going down using J, and the lines are selected. You notice that I'm now at line 11. And now that I've selected everything that I want to have, I enter command mode and Vim replaces my command line with the representation of the selection that I want to have. And I go along with that and say I want to search for alias and replace that with unalias and provide another slash at the end and enter that. And now only that specific selection from visual mode is changed. The other ones are not. So this is a very useful way to utilize the visual mode, select what I want to have, and then provide my search and replace pattern, and Vim will apply it only to that visual selection. You can also make a change in a certain range by providing the line numbers. Here I say I want to go from line 9 to 11, and search for, in this case, an alias, and replace that with alias, and close it with a forward slash, and now only those three lines were changed. So there are plenty of ways to make selections, either visual mode or using those line numbers, as well as providing the whole file using percent %s. In this video, I will show you how you can undo any changes in Vim and various ways how you can do those. So let's start a new text file. And as I start typing and write my text, I may want to change certain words and make changes to it. Maybe I want to change the word world here and, and I can do this in various ways. I could do DW to delete a word. Now, if I change my mind and want this word back, I could hit U to undo. And Vim confirms me in the lower left corner that one change was redone. And it was before a certain marker. And it was 11 seconds ago. Now, I can also say I don't want to delete this word but I want to change in this word or change this word. So I can say CW and it immediately brings me into insert modes and I can start typing the new word. Maybe I write users here and then I hit escape. And now I can also undo this and Vim restores the previous version 
and tells me that 16 seconds ago this change was made into world. Now, what if I change my mind again and want the old user's word back? Well, I could redo my change using Control R and Vim has this stored and gives me also this old version back. Okay, so let's change this and go out of Vim. And maybe I come back to this file either right away or a little later. And, and then I find, oh, I didn't want to write users. I wanted to write world in the first place. Now I try to hit undo and it tells me, oh, it's already at the oldest change because, because Vim only preserves these changes as long as the editor is open. And the same is true for redo. It tells me there is nothing newer to change. So Vim hasn't stored anything beyond this editor session, but there is a way to preserve that even, though, even after I've saved and quit this editor session. And that is just an entry in vimrc away. So I can say vim my vimrc and down at the bottom, I can say, of course, I give myself a little note here and say, activate undo file. And I say, set undo file. So what this does is Vim will preserve for each file that I'm editing a little undo file, which stores all the undo information, all the changes that I've made. And then I unmade or redid. And with that file, I can make changes beyond a certain editor session and come back to it afterwards and still restore or redo any changes I did. Let's save and see what this does. Now, of course, the changes I made earlier are not preserved, so I need to redo them. So again, I use change in word. I delete this word and now I write world again. Very good. I can undo those changes and redo them, of course, control R and here they are. Now let's save and get back to the editor. And now when I type U, I can still make changes, even though I opened a new editor session and I can also redo them. And that way the Vim undo file can become very handy in making these changes above editor sessions. And even though I come back to this file a long time later, maybe a year after today, I can still undo those changes because the undo file preserves it. So let's look at the directory where my file resides. And you can see that there's my text.txt at the bottom, but there's also a hidden file called .mytext.txt.un tilde. And that is the undo file that belongs to the my text file. And when I look at it, it contains some internal information. You can see in the first few characters, Vim undo, and that is internal information for Vim that it requires to undo any changes to the my text txt file in this case. So you don't need to understand anything specific in there. You can just see that all these changes that I've made for that file and undid and redid are preserved in there for the duration as long as this file exists. Now, if you use this feature a lot, you will have a lot of extra files in your directory that clutter up your file system and just uh, are lying around whether you need them or not. And this is just a lot of extra files in your directory, which you might not want to have. What you can do is you can let Vim store them in a separate directory where they're out of the way, but in case you need them, they can be pulled back from there. And to do that, you need to tell Vim a couple of instructions to save those. And I edit my vimrc file to create a .vim directory. And under that .vim directory, I create a separate undo directory. And in that undo directory, all the undo files, no matter how many files I will edit, will be stored and it's one central location where they are and there Vim can find them and reuse them in case I need to do the undos between editor sessions.
So instead of writing set undo file, I create a little text portion. So this is the portion of code that I wrote. It's a portion of Vim code. You don't need to understand it all in detail, but I'll explain it here. Here in line 19, I still have the set undo file, but I do some things before that. So first of all, say if Vim internally has the persistent undo between files and editing between them, Vim will then ask if there is already a directory in my home directory called .vim and slash undo dir. And if that doesn't exist, then Vim will create it for me. And in case it does exist, this if will be just skipped. And this set undo dir tells Vim when I'm using the undo files, please store all of them in the .vim undo dir under my home directory. So let's save and quit. And do another edit session of my text. And let's say I change this word one more time and call it fans maybe. And then let's undo this using you and save this file again. And now if I look at my local directory, the my txt.un is still there, but there is also a new directory there called .vim. You can see it was created and there is also an undo directory. And if I look in there, you can see that there's an entry for my text file. And this, is, and this is the undo file for my text file. And to make sure that Vim knows where the directory is, it encodes these with these percentage signs. And here, this is the change file. Again, storing all the changes that I've made to that file. So this way, all the changes that I'm doing in whatever file I am will be stored in the .vim slash undo dir file and not cluttered all over the file system, which is very messy. And I think the solution is very practical and useful and keeps your system tidy. In this video, we want to take a look at Vim's features designed for developers and computer programmers. So I have previously shown you most of the commands that make Vim useful as a standard text editor, but many of these functions can be used for writing code as well. And Vim has some extra functionality on top of that, which I'm going to demonstrate here. So for this purpose, I have a text file here with source code in it. So this is the file. Don't look into the source code too much. It's more of a demonstration and not the actual functionality that is being displayed here. The first thing you'll notice is that we have our line numbers and I should really activate my set relative number because I'm now getting used to it. The next thing you'll notice is that there is no syntax highlighting. So you don't see the keywords in a separate color. Vim has a built-in syntax feature, which is typically enabled unless you explicitly compiled Vim without it. And I don't see a reason why you should do that. So most Vim implementations should have it right away, especially when you install it from packages. And Vim supports pretty much all the programming languages out there. And syntax highlighting is added as new languages are developed. Most of the time when you open a file that Vim has a syntax highlighting file for it, it will open the file and provide the syntax highlighting right away. So you don't need to activate it, but sometimes Vim doesn't have it by default. So you need to help it is to go to command mode and write syntax enable. And it immediately applies this change and you can see that there is now a color applied to some of the keywords and some special programming constructs like if and else. And that makes it much easier to see the programming. Now, another thing that you will notice is that the indentation is a bit off. So this might be a newcomer in programming or you've wrote a lot of this code very late at night and uh, you basically got it working and didn't pay too much attention to the highlighting as long as the code is working. 
So Vim has a way to indent your source code for you, so, so you don't have to do that yourself. So let's demonstrate the indent function in this structure here. To indent this line, you run equals equals, and the line will be indented based on the current rule set, and depending on how wide your tab stops are and some of the other settings dealing with how tabs and spaces are interpreted. And even though this indentation might be a bit too wide, it's much better than the original one. So I can move to the next line and redo this and equals equals indents this line as well. Now let's look at another line. Maybe that needs to be indented. No, it doesn't. And Vim doesn't make any change to it because that is the indentation rule for this language and is much more pleasing to the eye. Now I can also provide this indentation not just on a single line, but perhaps for a block of text. So let's do this here. I can select a block of text in visual mode and select the lines that I want. And then while still in visual mode, I hit equals equals and the whole function is indented. Okay, so that's already something. I can also apply this indentation to the whole file, no matter how long it might be. And as you might remember from our previous exercise, when we did some navigation, to go to the beginning of the file, I would hit GG. So this is line one now. And to go to the end of the file, I hit capital G. And so this is important now because to apply this change, the indentation to the whole file, I would go to the beginning and write GG equals and then shift G to apply this change to the beginning of the file and the rest of the file, whatever is in between. And you can see the indentation has been applied to the whole file. To activate the syntax highlighting, I can go back, let's save this file first, in my vimrc, and there I make an addition to the end of the file. So I hit Shift G again, and then O, and then write activate syntax highlighting and then say syntax on and now when I open the file and now it's automatically applied depending on the programming language that and while I'm here I might as well activate set relative number so I will always have that next I want to demonstrate how you can change the width of a tab or the indentation level in general. For that, I have created a much smaller source code file called Hello World to demonstrate this. And again, if I would indent this line, I would type equals equals, and I can see it's indented, but the width of the indentation is a bit too wide for my taste. So I want to have it a little less and I want to have it set to four. First, I want to know what is the shift width and I ask Vim that shift width question mark and that is set to eight and it's probably part of the reason why this indentation is so wide and I can change it set shift width to four and then I undo my change the indentation using U and now if I do equals equals my indentation is those four characters if I go back to insert mode then I can see how many characters there are. And these are single spaces, but maybe I want to exchange four spaces with a tab. So how wide a tab is going to be. And the current value is eight. Let's change this. And now that I've done that, I can go back to insert mode and you can see that now four spaces have been replaced with a single tab. So I cannot change in any individual character here, but this is replaced with a single tab. So these are the changes that I always want to have, and these will definitely go into my vimrc file. And at the end, I give myself a bit of a hint what these changes do. So first of all, I set the shift width to four. I set the tab stop to four as well.
and here I see that my changes were applied. The next thing that I want to show you is that Vim is able to detect and work with numbers in interesting ways that other editors don't necessarily do. So let's open our Hello World program again. And I think I should add myself a variable here. And I set a value of four. Now, I can make this variable bigger or smaller and not edit it by hand. That is done from normal mode. And to do that, I go to the line where this number is that I want to change. And let's say I want to increase this number. I hit control A and now four has automatically been changed by Vim to five. And if I want to decrease a number, I hit control X and now it's back to four. Control X can go back to zero, can even get negative. And I can also make it bigger again by hitting control A. So, so this is useful. You don't have to go back to insert mode, remove the number, type in the new number and hit escape. With this combination, you can just increase and decrease any number that you like. I can also increase by any number that I want to have by just prefixing it. So let's say I want to increase this to 10. So I just type six control A and now I have 10. And the same can also be done with the decrease operation. So let's decrease by two. And this way I could basically enter any kind of number that I want. Now let's add an array here. This is my array. And I want to make sure that this array is properly initialized. So I say my array at position zero should have the value zero as well. Okay, so in order to initialize all the other array values, I copy it and paste it four times. But now I need to go to each index and change this one. And maybe I also not want to set it to zero, but I want to set it to an increasing number. So the array at position zero should be zero. At position one, there should be one. At position two, there should be two and so on. But that normally would require a lot of hand editing. But Vim can do that and help me with the functionality that I just showed you. So let's change the array indices first. I go to the place where I want to start and then hit control V to go to visual block mode and then select the numbers that I want to change. Those four, then I type G and then hit control A and you can see Vim applied this change and was smart enough to see that I want to have an increasing number of these and it applied those. So I have one, two, three, four. I can do this again. Let's set the first element to one, the second to two and so on. So again, I go into visual block mode, then select the numbers that I want to change, hit G and then control A and they change in the same way as before. I do this one more time, control V, select, hit G, don't forget that. And now control X, will give me minus one, minus two, and so on. Especially useful if you have a lot of numbers that you want to change at the same time, and Vim helps you with this functionality. A similar functionality can be used by programmers if they maybe want to comment out a bigger area. To add the comment character to a number of lines, I go into visual block mode, select the number of lines this should apply to, then hit shift I, then enter the comment character, in this case, two forward slashes, and then hit escape. And the comment is applied to all the lines that I selected previously.
In this video, I would like to demonstrate how Vim can make our typing life a little easier by helping us extending abbreviations and completing words that were already typed. So let's say I'm starting to write an article about dinosaurs and especially some of the flying ones, the pterodactyls, and maybe even that was pronounced incorrectly. So let's say I have a file here called dinosaurs. I start typing and here comes a very difficult word that I most of the time mistype and I want to make sure that I make it correct each time and Vim should help me in that. To do that I define an abbreviation to say I have a smaller word and the smaller word should be expanded by Vim to the more complicated one so that way I don't have to type the complicated word each time I just use the abbreviation and it will be expanded by Vim automatically as I type. First I save this file and then go back to my VimRC file and here at the bottom I start set some abbreviations. To define an abbreviation I start with IAB and then tell Vim what the word is that should be expanded. In this case, it's PTER. And then I provide the word that should be expanded to when PTER is detected. So now I look up the word one more time, make sure that it's correct. Then I save. Go back to my dinosaurs file. And now I can write P-T-E-R. And now watch what happens when I type either a space, a tap, or enter. Vim will take the definitions in my VimRC file and expand the word that I defined to the more complicated one. And that way I can start typing a smaller word and then Vim will expand that automatically for me. So that helps me keeping words consistently correct and even words that I usually mistype. Let's save and go back. So it doesn't have to be complicated words. I can also define other words like, for example, the name of our lecture. I type that a lot preparing this course, so I may want to save myself some typing. And of course, this is the expanded version. And now let's go back to our dinosaurs file and insert this here and say UFD. And as you can see, Vim can expand even multiple words, not just a single one. So you can basically write whole sentences using abbreviations if you like. Let's remove this here. I can also say I mistype common words fairly often. Maybe I'm a quick typer and by using that, I can make sure that even though I mistyped the keys in the wrong order. Vim will automatically correct that for me. So let's go back one more time to the VimRC file and insert a common misspelling TEH instead of the. And I want to make sure that this also is corrected when the uppercase form appears. And so now each time I type the, let's go back to my dinosaurs file. Now let's see if the abbreviations work. Maybe I was quick to type here and the got spelled wrong, but Vim will correct it for me by looking it up in the VimRC file. And if there is an abbreviation defined there for exactly this misspelled word, it will exchange it with the proper one. Another instance here, but Vim will correct it just the same. Now let's go back and try the uppercase version. And first I need to lowercase this word dinosaurs. And I can do that by replacing a single character by using R for replace and then type in this case, lowercase d and Vim will change that without having me to go into insert mode and change it there. In insert mode, I type the uppercase version wrong. And again, as soon as I start a new word with a space, Vim will go and change the word accordingly. This happens on enter and on tabs. 
and will also do it on so if I do an exclamation mark it will also know this is the end of a word and will exchange it with the proper one according to my abbreviation. Another way where Wim can help me is with the internal commands. So for example what I often do is I mistype the WQ improperly because I use uppercase W instead of lowercase and Wim will present me with a warning or an error message when I do that. So let's try this and see how this looks like. So instead of typing WQ, I type uppercase WQ. And Vim tells me that it doesn't recognize this editor command because I was using WQ and not the lowercase version. But I can teach Vim to use this command by editing one more time the vimrc file. And I say maybe catch stupid command typos. And here I can define a new command. And that should be first the new command that I want to define. So in this case, it's uppercase WQ. And now I type the command that this should replace with. So the second one is a proper command working in Vim already. And this is, of course, WQ. And while I'm here, I can do the same for quit, because I also type this uppercase most of the time when I'm typing quickly. So to catch this as well, I want to use Q lowercase here. So I save. And let's visit the dinosaur. And now let's make some changes. I delete these three lines that I don't need anymore. And now when I want to save, I can use uppercase WQ and Wim will recognize it and not give me an error message this time and use the command just as I defined it. Let's see if it works for the uppercase Q and it does. And this way you can define some common commands that you sometimes mistype in Vim, but that should still have a function in case you mistype them. Vim is also smart enough to complete words for you that were already typed in this text or in this editor session. So let's go back to our dinosaurs file. And here I typed a couple of words already. And maybe I want to reuse these words without fully typing them each time again in the rest of the text. Maybe I'll start. So I want to complete this word to dinosaurs, but I don't want to type the rest of the characters. What I can do is I let Vim autocomplete it for me by pressing Control N. And it tells me at the bottom keyword completion found just one match in this text. So it was clear what was meant. And as you saw, it was completed to the rest of the word. And let's try it again. It's again clear that I meant pterodactylos. And if I type control N again, it will automatically correct this. So as you type, you might use this a couple of times when you have a word that's already there and you can complete that and move on to the next word. Now let's look at our source file from an earlier exercise. And here's a lot more text and source code. And maybe here at the end, I want to call one of the functions, but I don't have to remember the whole function name. Vim will help me. I type list and then control P. Control P is basically including everything that you have typed until now. And if there are words coming up in the text that's after your current cursor position, these aren't included. But with control P, I can get more words because I have a lot more text here in this file already. Control P. And now it's not clear what I meant. There are a couple of words that start with list in this text. And Vim offers me a small menu that pops up. And now I can either use list, list delete, or list end. And to cycle through them, I press Control P again. And watch what happens with the word, Vim will automatically complete it to the current selected word. 
and I can move through the list by continuously pressing Control P until I get to the word that I want to have. It tells me back at original, so now I'm at list again, and maybe I'll pick list delete here. So this is match two of three. And now I select the one that I like and press space, and it will be completed for me and I can continue typing. So this is very useful, especially when you use or reuse a lot of words that you've already typed and let Vim complete it for you by typing the first few characters and then pressing Control P. Now Vim can also not just complete single words, but whole lines or complete sentences. So to do this, you go into completion mode and completion mode is accessed using Control X and then you will press another modifier. So it's Control X. And to get to the whole line, you would press Control L. And now it offers me a list again of sentences or words. In this case, a whole sentence is everything until a semicolon. And now I can use Control L again to cycle through the list and pick the one that I like. Maybe I use the middle one and type Enter to select it. And this way, it saves me a lot of typing. I just typed list, completed, and I have all the rest in my line here. So I encourage you to try this out and make it part of your Vim repertoire because it saves you a lot of typing and makes completing source code or other text much more consistent and much quicker. In this video, we're going to learn about filters and macros. So first I want to show you the file that I want to work with. It's containing numbers and you can see it's kind of cluttered and messy and not very well aligned. So that's the first thing I want to show you using filters. I can make this file align a bit better. So that's the first task that I'm going to do. And filters in Vim allow you to run your current editor's content, the window and the contents we're currently seeing, through a shell program, any kind of program that you're running or that you wrote yourself. And you can then put this text or whatever it is through that command, you filter it through that command, and then the result of that command, whatever it might be, will, will be put back into the Wim editor. To start explaining these filters, I first want to show you how you can branch Wim edit from, from your current Wim editing session out into the shell. Maybe look something up or run a command and use that output to continue with your editing. You don't need to quit the editor, run the command on your shell and then run Wim again. You can stay in your Vim editing session and just run a command that you want to run and then come back to your Vim session. To do this, you go into your last line mode and type the exclamation mark to indicate that everything that now follows should be run through a shell and not in the editor. And let's run a date command. So it shows me the date from the time that I was recording this and it tells me to enter or type a new command to continue and I do this and I come back to my editing session and can continue. So now that I've looked up the date, maybe I use it in my editing. What I can also do is I can put that date, as I showed you earlier, with the read command into the buffer. So I can say r exclamation mark date, and it will be inserted into my current editor session. Maybe I want to have the current date or at least parts of it in my document to tell myself or the world when that document was edited. And that I can use by just running it through a filter and inserting the resulting command from the command line into my window. And I can use that to run this command from the shell and the result should not be put into the standard out. It should be put into my Vim session. Okay, so let's undo this here. As you see, this file is not very well aligned, so I cannot make heads and tails of, you know, where columns begin or end. And that's a perfect use case to demonstrate the filter. So now I can run the complete content here from my editing window or from this buffer 
through a filter, in this case, the column filter, there's a column program, and it takes this as input, processes it, and the result of that is not put on the command line, but it's put back into the Vim editor session. So my output here is filtered through the command. To execute this, I go to command mode and run percent to tell that I want to put the contents into the following command and I want to branch out into the shell. I want to use the exclamation mark again. And now I run the column command using the T parameter, which tells column to output a tabular format. So this is nicely aligned. And if I run this, you can see that Vim took all the numbers in there, filtered them through the column program, and the result is put back into my editor window, replacing what was there before. So that's very useful, but I can do more. Maybe I want to sort this by the second column, and certainly Vim can do that. I can run percent exclamation mark, the sort program, and that has a columnal parameter, and I can define which column to sort. So in this case, I want to sort by the second column. And if I execute this, Vim will filter this through the sort program, and it will order the numbers according to their size. And you can see now that the numbers are at a different position according to their relative value to the other numbers. Another program that you can use if you have a very long text, you might want to make it fit on the screen. And to do that, you would say, I only allow a certain number of characters per line and the rest should be wrapped into the next one. To do that, there is a fold program. So here I fold at maybe 10 characters. And when I run this, it would break all the characters that are in excess of 10 to the next line. And if there are none, then it would continue. So these three filters are just an example of what you can do. So if Vim doesn't provide a certain functionality out of the box, then you can filter everything through the command line, either any Unix command that is already there, a program that you installed separately, maybe from the internet, or a program that you wrote yourself. And all that can be used with Vim's filters. You pass in some text or some editor's content and process it in a certain way, and the result is put back into your editing window. Very powerful, very useful, and extends the functionality of Vim tremendously. So let's talk about macros. Macros in Vim allow you to record a sequence of keystrokes and then store those, and then at a later time, reuse them without having to type the sequence again. So you can say, I want to maybe record my keystroke ABC, store that, and then when I need that sequence again, I can just execute that macro and it will provide the ABC for me. Macros are stored in registers. So let's look at our registers here. And you can see that there's some content there already. So let's store our macro in register M for macro. So let's record a macro to include these numbers in double quotes. And I do this for one line and then stop the recording. To start recording a macro, I type Q and then the register where this should be stored in, in this case M. And then it tells me in the lower left corner that it is indeed recording that macro into register M. And then I type the sequence of keystrokes. So first I should go into insert mode and do the first double quotes. Then go to the end of the word, hit insert. Here in this video, we will take a look at how to split the screen and in various ways. You might have noticed before that I was only using a very small portion of the screen to show the editor's content. And that's certainly a little bit of a waste and we can certainly do better, especially when we look up multiple files in parallel in the editor. So let's start by going into a file that we've worked with before. And here you can see that Vim uses the whole editor and there is all the screen real estate being used. But maybe that's too much for me and I only want to concentrate on a small portion. And in another part of the screen, maybe on the right, I want to display a different file. And this is useful if I maybe look up something in one window and in the other one I'm doing the programming or I have two files side by side and I want to compare the contents. 
Vim has a way to split the screen using splits and the splits can be activated using either a horizontal split or a vertical split. So let's start with a vertical split and the splits can be activated using the command mode and it starts with V split and that does a vertical split of the same file. So you can see the cursors in the left at the moment and I can use H, J, K and L in combination with control W to switch these splits. So let's do this here. Control W left goes to the right window and I can move my cursor here. You can see the left window is not affected by that. And I can maybe go to the bottom of the file and maybe I look something up there. And when I'm done, I switch back using control W H and here I'm back in the left side and the right side stays where it is. So let's say I want to have another split and typing V split for vertical split most of the time is a bit tedious. So the Vim developers thought to shorten that a little bit and just abbreviate it to VSP. And it opens another split with the same file and I can move between them and have a much nicer editing experience using this. How do I close a split? Well, it's the same as you would use to close the main editor window, colon Q, and it will only close the currently active split. And let's close this one as well. Okay, so I have my original window back and it's the only one. So let's open a horizontal split and that is done using colon split. And now you can see the window has been divided in the middle and I can move around in the upper part and switch down to the lower part using control W and J. And this way I have the same file but different portions of it. And I can see maybe how a certain function is defined and maybe I'm calling the function in a certain other part of that file. So that's a really good way of having the same file open in various sections. I can open another split. And again, the Vim developers thought if you use splits a lot, then you shouldn't type so much. So they abbreviated the horizontal splits to SP. And here I have three now. So the middle one is currently active and you can see you can change these splits or between them and have a much different view of your file. To close these splits, you can say, I want to close every split that I currently have, but keep the one where my cursor currently is active. So it's this one. And to close the other two or any others, how many I might have, I can use colon and then on or only. I can abbreviate that to on. And this will close the other ones and I have my original window back. You can also combine horizontal and vertical splits. So let's do another vertical split, VSP. And now let's switch over to this split and maybe the right one is a bit too big for my taste and I want to split this one with a horizontal one more time. So I do SP in this one. And now on the left side, I have a full window and on the right, I have two with a horizontal split in between the two. Very useful, especially when you're working on a lot of files or in the same file that is very big in various parts of the file. So to close these two again, I can go and close the ones that I don't need and get back my original window. And of course you can open more splits than just these three. There is plenty of screen space available on most of the screens nowadays, so you can open as many splits as you like. So let's open a split with a different file. So let's do another vertical split. And here you can provide the file name. So let's open my Hello World program on the right side maybe. Okay, it ended up in the left part, but you can see it's a different file. Now, if I do want to have the windows switched around, maybe the left should be on the right and vice versa. 
I can rotate them. And to do that, I use a rotation command. And to activate that, I use Control W and then R. And that rotates the two. You can see both have switched places. And now I have my smaller file on the right. I can switch again using Control W and R. And it gets more interesting when I have multiple splits open. So let's open another horizontal split here with maybe my dinosaurs file. You might remember this one. So now I have three windows open. And now if I rotate Control W, R, you can see that these two have switched places. Let's rotate again. And so this way I can rotate the top with the bottom one. And I can also do the reverse using Control W capital R. And this way they would change places the other way around from right to left instead of from left to right. Now this window that I have here, I want to have this moved to the left and use the full screen height. And that is done using Control W capital H. And you can see it became a full window and the other ones moved to the side to equally share the screen. Let's move to the one on the right. And this one should now move to the bottom and use the full screen width. And that is done using Control W capital J. And this way you can arrange these splits any way you like. And of course, open new ones the way you like and rotate them again. Now, you might also have an idea of making one window a bit smaller than the other ones. Vim tries to arrange these windows, giving each one the same space. But you can also say this window doesn't need that much space and I can make it smaller to give the other ones a bit more space. And that is done using Control W minus to incrementally decrease the window's height. So let's try this here. Here it moved down. And this way I can give them a bit more space. To increase the window to the right, you can do Control W greater than sign. And of course I can move it back. So this way you can make the windows incrementally smaller or bigger. To restore the original window sizes equally for each one, I can use Control W equal. And this way all the windows have the same screen real estate again. So let's close all the other windows one more time. And splits are also used when you access the help system, which we haven't looked at yet. To access the help system, you would type colon H for help. And then maybe I want to know about cursor line and you can use tab here to help. And these are all the options that contain cursor. But let's look up cursor line. And here Vim opens a split for us and tells me more about how to activate cursor line and what it actually is and what other options it provides. If I want to go back to my original editor, I use the same split movements, control W, J, and I'm back down in my original window. And maybe I keep the help open. Maybe I want to edit my vimrc file and enter some of the things that I read in the help file. To close the help again, I move back to the window and either look up another item in the help system or I just close it. So here I look up relative number and now that I've looked it up, maybe I don't want to have it on my screen. So I just close it and now I have my full window back. So splits are pretty powerful in giving you just the right amount of space on the screen and put multiple files on the screen or the help system. And that gives you the fullest use of your screen in the Vim editor.